Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Valdete Berisha. I manage the FinDev Gateway. Um, welcome to our webinar today. Before I hand over to our host, Esther Lee Rosen, I am going to go over a few logistical details. We have about 150 people who have registered for this webinar, and we expect um, uh, about a third to show up today. So as a result, this webinar will be an audio broadcast only. Unfortunately, we cannot um, allow microphones to be open for attendees because it's uh, unmanageable. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, to, you can do that throughout the webinar by using the chat box on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just make sure when you type your question to select all participants from the drop-down drop menu because that's the only way we can make sure that the, our moderator, Esther, will, will get the questions. Um, I encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar and um, don't hesitate um, to, to chat. So thanks again. And with that, I actually just wanted to also uh, let you know that we will send the recording at the end um, of the day today or tomorrow, so within the next 24 hours. So with that, I'll hand it over to Esther. Thank you, Valdete. Good morning and good afternoon for some of you. Thank you for joining us today for the Change Management, Business Opportunity, and Customer Centricity webinar. We would like to welcome you to the first in a series of four webinars under our Customer Centricity work. This series was a result of demand by our partners who, through their involvement and knowledge of our efforts, wanted additional guidance on how to design and deliver effective financial services for their low-income customers. Following today's discussion, please join us for our next webinar in this series focused on agent and employee empowerment on April 4th. Building on the change management toolkit featured in the guide, Harold Kutsia, our main speaker in today's webinar, will discuss the importance of the change management process and walk you through a series of steps that management teams can take to prepare and support employees as their organization shifts to a more customer-centric model. I would like to now introduce you to Harrod, who leads the customer value team at CGAP, and he has been a stalwart champion of this work. Harrod is also an extraordinary professor at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. Prior to CGAP, Harrod has had extensive experience both in the public and private sectors, including his role as the head of inclusive banking at APSA Bank in South Africa. He's also the founder and director of the Center for Inclusive Banking in Africa and professor in agricultural economics at the University of Pretoria, among other key leadership roles. After Harrod's presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A, so please submit your questions through the chat feature anytime throughout the presentation. Without further delay, I will now hand the mic over to Harrod. Thank you very much. Esther and Valdete, and um, it's a great pleasure to kick off this series of uh, webinars that we'll have over the next four months with, uh, with an introduction to customer-centric business models and to also uh, dig a little bit deeper in the change management process that is so important in everything that we do. Um, the work centers and, um, and is echoed in the guide to customer-centric models, which is on the CGAP uh, uh, website. And what I will do is I will give you a direct link to it a little bit later so that you can go in and look around and sort of take a journey through the guide. But I'll come back to the guide. Let us start with why we are doing this and why we did all the work around the guide. Uh, when we looked at, um, at the opening of financial accounts in our financial inclusion community and world, we realize that we are actually getting quite good at doing that. And that we, um, we uh, by following the global fundex, reckon that we've opened over 1.2 billion accounts between 2011 and 2017. That is about 150 million mobile accounts and just over a billion uh, bank or fin formal financial institution accounts. Now, let's think like business people and think about our, our business case here. And let's first calculate the opening cost of those accounts, which is about 21.75 billion, given the assumptions that we reflect on the slide. 
that you should be able to see. Now, 21.75 billion is a massive amount. And if you have to cover those costs, then you would at least expect to make some return from the usage of the accounts. And here is where we have the problem. The majority of those accounts are not used. Uh, about two thirds of the mobile accounts are used less than once in 90 days. But 50% of the bank accounts are used less than a month, once a month. And a lot of the bank accounts that are used, we call mailbox accounts. And they are literally accounts that uh, receive the money from either a grant or a wage. And within two to three days, the account holder will clean the account and not use that account again, and then continue the rest of the period in cash. It means that there is a massive challenge on account usage and making business models work. But this business model is not only for the financial service provider, it's also the business case for the customer. Does the customer see value in this account and therefore use it? And the answer I would argue is no, because that's why they're not using it. So let's go and think a little bit about what the customers are saying in terms of why they're not, uh, they're not using accounts. So let's look at the customer views on the next slide. Customers provide several views, but we've divided those views into two types of value. The first type of value is functional value, and that means did the account do what it promised to do? Uh, for example, if I wanted to send some money to Esther, was it easy for me to send? Was it easy for her to receive? Did she understand it? Did I understand it? Did the money arrive when the service provider promised it will arrive? That is functional value. So uh, customers tell us that accounts are not relevant to their needs, not fulfilling the function that they expected to fulfill. Their expectations are not met around these accounts. They see no value in having an account besides getting paid or receiving money. And they also complain about the cost of formal financial services. There's a second type of value that we uh, differentiate value in, and that is experiential value. And that, that means, um, or that refers to the experience the, uh, the customer had in using the account, in engaging with the financial service provider. And, um, and they tell us that they lack confidence to engage with FSPs or financial service providers, which means that the way we present the account, the way we treat the customers, the way we design the account doesn't instill confidence uh, that they actually, on several iterations, build up confidence and feel better in interacting with financial service providers. And then secondly, they tell us they do not trust financial service providers. They do not feel valued or respected. But at the same time, we should ask provider views. And providers tell us that it's difficult to reach customer segments and specific customer segments that are remote rural, that are illiterate, innumerate, that are um, uh, sort of not engaging in, in consistent economic activity. They uh, state that there's little uptake and little use from these segments in what they offer the segments. There's a lack of understanding that they have of customer needs, what motivates customers, why customers behave in a certain way. There's a lack of capacity to design and deliver customer-focused solutions and good customer experience. And obviously, this leads to an inability to create value for them. So by looking at this, we, uh, we uh, start thinking around what would be a solution here, because there must be many solutions, but what will be an important solution, a foundational solution here? And we looked at a customer-centric business model as something that would lead to a solution. And, um, and you, you are going to ask, what is a customer-centric business model? Now, it is not just being nice to the client and smile when you see them and just go and visit them and, and chat to them nowadays. It's a little bit more than that. It is about putting the client, the client or the customer in the middle of this ecosystem in which you operate as a financial service provider and driving all decisions 
by thinking about that customer. Who are in this ecosystem? Well, not only the customer, but your employees, your suppliers, including your partners, your shareholders, and the communities you, you as an organization serve. All of those are the ecosystem. And therefore, it is important to work across this ecosystem to build a customer-centric model. Why do people choose to take up customer-centric models? And, um, and it's normally because there's some kind of shock in their system, some kind of challenge. And this is such a reality of our lives that we don't often change any of our behavior unless there's a challenge or a shock uh, to the system. And the kind of shocks and challenges that we are referring to here are shocks where customers uh, experience negative uh, uh, situations that erode customer trust, leading to non-take-up of loans, low usage of accounts, dropouts or lapses of insurance policies, dormancy of savings and transactional accounts, more customers nowadays demand value as well because they're better informed because of social media, because of good functioning networks, and it is a much more competitive playing field. Now, all these shocks I've just mentioned are what we call push shocks. It push you to change, but there are also pull factors that lead to change, and one of them is the quest for sustainable business growth and to turn your business model into a more sustainable model for your firm. And that sustainability often has to do with a social mission as well. We are really trying to change the lives of people. And, there, and for that, customer-centric business models are absolutely ideal. How do you move from what you have now to a customer-centric model? And there are 10 dimensions. I'm just mentioning three here, strategy, culture, and structure. In strategy, you have to ask yourself, you as leadership, are you focusing on uh, the, the reality of the customer or are you focusing on products? Because if you focus on the reality of the customer, you do not have to focus on products because you will know what to deliver to the, to the customer. So there is a strategic change in terms of how you think about your business that is needed. That leads to a culture, a culture in your organization that puts the customer in the middle, that actually incentivizes your employees by the customer to solve customer problems rather than to sell and drive, uh, sell and drive campaigns. And the third important notion here is structure. Do you have a firm that is organized in product silos? So this is the loans department, the savings department, that is the motor vehicle finance department or the small business finance department? Or do you have cross-functional teams that um, you apply across your business? And those are very important considerations, the definition what pushes you there, and how to get there. And we'll come back to that because that strategic, cultural, and structural shift is the essence of what you have to change in a change management process in your organization. But before we get to change, let us now give you a little bit of evidence because in a business case, you always have to have evidence of success. Now, if you look at the next slide, top right, internationally, we've learned that a 2% improvement in retention of customers leads to a 10% decrease in cost. And that is actually a no-brainer because if you don't have to recruit new customers, train new customers, set up new systems for customers, and you can use your um, collateral and assets you've already invested in, your customers that you have in your portfolio, it is a far cheaper process to interact with them than starting anew. Two of our partners, and it's very important that I emphasize that we have built this guide and this whole body of thinking around customer-centric models with technical service provider partners and with financial service provider partners across um, the financial inclusion world. And one of our partners, Pioneer from the Philippines, started out on this customer-centric journey years ago, and they realized that um, by really understanding their customers at the granular level and they used customer journey maps, they could change the way they interact with customers through their partnerships and direct customer service inventions 
And between 2014 and 2017, they've seen a, a double up in premiums, a three times increase in enrollments, and they are going strong as we speak today in this area. Another partner, Digicel from Haiti, uh, focused on uh, customer needs, understanding customer needs, understanding agent, uh, the agents and uh, improving their training, uh, changing their pricing, and empowering their customers to understand the functionality of the mobile account that they offered better. And they moved their active customers from 40,000 in 2015 to over 800,000 in 2017. Only two examples, and in the guide or on the guide, you will see many more examples on the case studies. Now let us move from, uh, from the guide to change. Now, no organization has ever changed without a reason. I've argued that before. And you have to understand these reasons very well. Um, most businesses start with the reason for change when they see a business challenge, uh, as I've alluded earlier. And you have to think about this pain point that you are experiencing as a business. And it's not always a pain point. It could be an opportunity that you see as well. And the challenge for you is to see whether you can think about that pain point through a customer lens. For example, if you see that retention is a pain point, what does the customer see? Because the customer doesn't say, oh, retention is a pain point. The customer says, I have been treated badly, or this product is not for me, or the response time of the organization is too slow, and therefore they move away from the organization, and then you have a retention problem. So your challenge is, before you think about something that you want to change in your organization, to take it from your organization's perspective and from the customer's perspective, and we call that the customer-centric challenge. Now, uh, we have a whole exercise where we actually take financial service providers through the process of how you redefine challenges into customer-centric challenges and how then you analyze it and change it. And this is explained in the guide. But, um, but what is important is that change is hard. Change is not an easy thing. Uh, we have legacy systems that keep us sort of back we have incentives that keep us away from change because you have to invest in change. And your starting models may be aligned to a different model than the model that you have to, to move to. So change is hard. And you as financial inclusion leaders must develop the hard and soft skills to lead and organize for change. And this is what the change management toolkit is about in the customer century guide. Now, what we... Uh, can do is we can sort of flex the muscles a little bit and see whether you can participate in an exercise on this webinar to see where you could consider change in your organization. Now, Valdete sent all of the registered participants this one page, two sides or two pages <laughs> um, assessment, which we call the organizational shift self-assessment activity. Let us complete it together. We, I'm sitting here and I'll chat about it and you on that side can quickly complete it and I'll explain how. And then we're going to give you a little bit of a question with a polling uh, mechanism we have um, when we are finished with that. We'll take a minute or two on it and you can proceed and complete it. There are 10 statements that start with strategy, culture, organizational structure, value propositions and on. And in each statement you'll see on the left-hand side is a statement that describes a less customer-centric organization, and on the right-hand side is a statement that describes a more customer-centric organization. Now, I'm sure you've looked at this already, and some of you already completed it, but please take your, your time and, uh, and go through each one of them and quickly show, just with a little cross on your paper, where are you? Are you left of the middle or right of the middle? Um, so uh, uh, let's do that. Um, while we are doing that, we can also uh, just look at the chat and see some people are not getting audio. Are we attending to that? Very good. Um, and uh, um, the, the 10 uh, dimensions are very easy to have a quick look at 
and quickly complete. And when you are complete, uh, uh, when you have completed that, you can answer the poll uh, that is on the next slide, and the poll function is now being provided by Valdete. Okay, you'll see there. So the first answer is when if you have uh, only zero to three areas for change on the less customer-centric side, that actually means that you are a very customer-centric organization. The second option, if you have four to six areas for change on the less customer-centric side, the left-hand side of the, the questions. And the third option is if you have seven to 10 areas for change on the less customer-centric side. Um, and that is a very nice, Ten very simple questions that you can do on your own or with your management team or your unit team in the organization and gives you a very good indication where you are as an organization and, uh, and where you uh, have to go to to change the organization. Uh, so uh, let's see whether people are voting already. And I'll give it a minute. Think about it, a webinar with one minute of silence. And if people haven't received the exercise, I just posted the link in the chat box. I'm not going to stand still for too long here because we've got about uh, 10 more minutes of presentation before we open for questions and discussion. So uh, let us uh, vote. Those of you who can vote now, and then we, uh, we uh, look at the results. Okay, I see the voting is going on vigorously, and we'll get the, the assessment on this webinar for how customer-centric the webinar participants are uh, in a moment, uh, and then I'll go on and illustrate the change management process that you can now follow after assessing yourself uh, as an organization. I, I, can I just also mention, this is Valdete, once you click in your answer choices, don't forget to submit, to submit your poll, because sometimes that, you, you need to scroll down a little bit to do that. This is also a good exercise because we're going to run a second poll and a third poll today on this webinar uh, towards the end of the webinar. Okay, maybe we must close it now. And if you can tell me which is the highest uh, one, number one, two, or three, I would appreciate that. Okay, 14 seconds. We have five more seconds. Very good, very good. Paul is nearly there. Okay. So it seems to me that um, at the moment uh, we have uh, a lot of people that have not answered yet, 32 out of the 54, but uh, um, there is a surprise for me on this poll because uh, it seems to me that I'm speaking to the converted here, people who understand customer centricity reasonably well, uh, some of them only having naught to three areas for change, some of them having four to six areas for change, and really not many uh, in the seven to ten area, areas for change. Or well, maybe those are the people that are more harsh on themselves in terms of this assessment. But um, use this, uh, this little questionnaire in your organization, amongst your teams, as I've said, and let us go on with uh, the president, how do you affect change? Now, um, it is important for you also to focus on what you've just assessed and maybe use one area where you have a strength and leverage from that and one area where you have a weakness that you can work on. Um, this slide that I'm uh, projecting now shows you the whole um, layout of the customer-centric uh, change management toolkit. And you will see that we identified uh, two areas in the toolkit that we have elaborated and uh, dug in uh, um, in those areas. Um, first is if you have 
a change problem at the moment and you want to effect change in your organization. We call that the catalyze and set in motion um, um, phase because you have now in part A, you have to face change at the moment. And there are four steps that we explain how you can actually manage this change. And they are sounding the alarm, laying the foundation for change or resetting your, uh, uh, your organization, quote unquote, catalyzing the change process and begin experimenting with change and prepare employees for long-term change process. That is what you do when you are faced with change. But when you are not faced with change, which is probably rare, uh, but when you have time and you do things in your organization to bolt your organization's capacity, you can focus it on it in a way as described in part B, bolt your customer-centric architecture and capability for change. And that is where we've defined three work streams. One is a work stream completely focused on how you create cross-functional teams and break down the silos in your organization. The second work stream is about building the four systems that will enable your organization to deliver and evolve superior customer experience and value propositions and actually effect change easier. And that's about innovation, talent, performance measurement, and partner engagement. And the third work stream are the, the three key and, uh, or sorry, the four key enablers that we identified that help you to change your organization to a customer-centric organization. And it has to do with culture, how you actually empower people through storytelling, how you reward and incentivize people, and how you use digital technology to do it. But today we don't have adequate time because we've just got a few minutes left in this presentation. And I'm only going to focus on part A number one, sound the alarm and signal the need for change because that is a very important uh, area. So we are going to focus on that. And here is where uh, the, the point where you actually tell people what is the challenge facing the organization. And most people in the organization will understand that challenge from a specific point of view their own. And you have to actually get evidence to get everybody to the same page to start your customer-centric journey uh, and in this change process. And the alarm can be sounded for many reasons. I've alluded to some of them in the beginning, but it could be because of deteriorating performance, a pressing problem or external threat, like a competitor that moved into your area, negative public opinion after your digital credit products hurt a few people, um, digital transformation requirements in this age of digital where a lot of organizations ask us, so how do I do this digital transformation? And there may be many other courses you can think about that and apply to your institution. I'm gonna give you an example of one institution. This is the South African example. It's probably because I'm a South African and I'm using that example. Uh, of a metropolitan insurance firm in South Africa. That is a firm that work across Africa. And they were uh, focusing uh, internally on several problems they see through their information systems. But the essential problem is they called it a business slowly going out of business. And you can see that they are in several countries, countries in West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. And what they found in their business is that their market share was declining uh, by close to 50% over a 15-year period, so half of uh, what they had before. Margins were getting smaller, uh, and they had the largest but least productive sales force in the industry. And then they realized that they were making money notwithstanding that because nobody was claiming in their microinsurance portfolios. Nobody was claiming. Well, that's a little bit of a strong statement. They have very, very few claims compared to what they expected. And they couldn't understand what was going on. So they started digging deeper, doing some research in the organization, collecting some information. And then they realized that the big problem is that they sell insurance but they don't inform and educate their customers and both systems And when somebody dies that the family is empowered to actually submit the claim and execute the process 
to get the payout. They are weak on that. And they felt bad about that because as an organization, they felt bad and hard. They, they said uh, 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 to us, part of our catalyst for change was that people in metropolitan work with heart. When you see those that you serve struggle for financial stability, you realize that you can't spill their money or waste their money. That quote was given to us by the head of customer experience, Bernice Hickman. And they solved this problem by further sensitizing their frontline staff to it, and they designed a system where a client would um, identify a person in his or her immediate family or immediate um, community that would be a trusted one that would help the family to submit the claim in case of a customer passing away. So they built a system around that. But how do they collect all this information and how do they actually get to this point? And this is so important a lesson in a changed process. They made the heart and mind connection. Let me elaborate a little bit on this. If you connect with the need for change on both a rational analytical level and an emotional empathy-based level, people normally listen to you. For example, a very quick story, and I'm running a little behind here, but a very quick story. Uh, one of the customers actually uh, stop paying his policy, and he's been a, a good payer of this policy for three or four years after he took out the policy. All premiums were paid, and suddenly he stopped. And the frontline staff member or the agent actually went to the customer's house and asked the customer, so why did you stop? And he said, you know what, I was on the way taking my daughter to school on the motorcycle, and her backpack fell off the motorcycle and somebody picked it up and ran away. This is South Africa, we have problems like that. And now I used my money to buy her a new backpack and new school books and I didn't have any money to pay the premium. And the frontline staff member felt that this is so wrong. Here is a story um, that is so important. Let me go and tell the story to my managers. And when the managers heard the story, they connected at an emotional level with the story, and they realized that by giving this uh, customer a pause um, of a month or two in the premiums, they could save the situation for the customer. And that is based on a story that gives customer context, that is emotional, connect with all of us, because we have children or we know people with children that send them to school and send a very important um, uh, sort of aspect in the lives of families, and therefore it has, we have empathy for that kind of uh, challenge. So uh, uh, we've learned that when you connect at the rational analytical level, you have to state percentages. You have to say a 2% increase in customer retention leads to a 10% decrease in costs, or whatever else we've stated there. We've also learned that when you engage at the at the, at the emotional level, that you have good percentages, but not because you've quoted the percentages, because you've connected at the emotional level. And here we see uh, research that shows that firms that demonstrate better performance, um, um, demonstrate better performance when managers engage directly with customer experience. In other words, they speak to the customers, they observe the customers, they understand at the management level customers' lives. And the reason why Metropolitan was successful, they could make this heart and mind connection, and we call it the stats and stories connection uh, in their organization. So how would you make the case for customer-centric change in your organization? Is it by telling stories? Is it by mentioning statistics? Or is it by more stories and a little bit of statistics? Or more statistics and a little bit of stories? or a good blend of the two. Why don't you tell us? That will be interesting. How would you make the case for customer-centric change in your organization using stats and stories? And let's go through this poll quickly uh, just to see where we stand as a community.
So uh, I assume you have submitted your um, your uh, vote in the poll. You've chosen the option that would describe your company's uh, approach or your firm's approach to making uh, the case for customer centric change or any other change in the organization and um, and I would uh, uh, ask Valdetta to uh, uh, just close the poll and um, just give an indication where we are now. Okay. So it seems to me that we are working in uh, in a community that uh, that uh, likes statistics, a little bit less stories, but a good blend of stories and statistics. So I think you really get this the thing about mind and and uh, and uh, heart, uh, and this is an important starting point for the change process in your organisation. How do you actually collect these uh, stories? Um, now, Metropolitan used customer journey mapping the sonas, storytelling, and immersion uh, in their quest to get their management and staff connected to their customers. And you can decide what to do. And to do that, you need tools. Now, we have a whole customer's uh, guide website, which you can see there, customersguide.stiga.org, where you can find a myriad of tools of uh, toolkits, case studies, tips and templates, and references. And the way we've put this guide together is we have um, asked four basic questions. The first question we said is why would anybody want to change? And there's a whole section on the guide that argues why. And then we said, well, if you know why, then you must understand how. And then there's three more questions um, that you ask on the how. The first question is, how do I learn from my customers? And there's a whole section that guides you through the learning process. How do you collect information? How do you analyze the information? The second question you ask on the how is, now that I know something about my customers, how do I design a better experience for them? And then there's another section on the guide under design that guides you through that experience. And then the fourth question is, now how do I organize the delivery? How do I manage the change to implement this customer-centric approach uh, that we have designed? And that is given guidance on under uh, organize. There's also a section with a lot of resources, which is under the tab, resources. And you'll find 134 resources organized in toolkits, case studies, tips and templates and references. And I'm going to show you the sort of key toolkits. And you will see when you get the presentation that each of these pictures of the toolkits are linked, hyperlinked to the toolkit. So you can just go in and, and download it. Um, it is also important before I explain these toolkits that you understand uh, your organization, and we've got tools for you to analyze your organization. Right on the first page of the guide, if you go into the guide uh, on the website, you'll find a diagnostic that you can use for your organization that is much more granular than the 10 questions you've just asked now, which is more the strategic shifts that you have to undertake. If we turn to the toolkits, um, the first toolkit you'll see there is the voice of the customer toolkit that takes you through an experience uh, and an, an, an approach how to set up voice of customers uh, of the customer systems, how to use it, how to start a, a, a conversation that is not only one directional, but it is an interaction and a real conversation between you and customers, and how to co-create with customers. The next one is the customer analytics toolkit that takes you through how do you analyze your customer data. The third one is how do you segment your customers, the segmentation toolkit. The fourth one on customer experience, how do you design customer experience where we uh, define customer experience as the full experience, the product, the channel, and every interaction you have with your customer, whether that is through a brochure, through a frontline staff, through a mobile device. Um, the fifth one 
is about employee and agent empowerment, and this is exactly what we are going to address on the 4th of April, where Antonique Konen and her team will take you through that process. It's extremely important nowadays that frontline staff, your employees, and agents speak from the same text, uh, interact with customers in the same way, and that way you protect your relationship with your customer, even working through agents. And the last toolkit is the one that we just touched on today, which is the change management toolkit, and you'll find um, granular guidance in that toolkit for all facets of change management, as I explained. Now, this is the end of the presentation, and um, I'm handing this over back to Esther to handle questions. And I have just three questions. Has an alarm bell already sounded in your organization that you have to think about in terms of change? Are you currently listening to your customers, and how are you listening to your customers? And what is the one takeaway that you will make your own from today's presentation and work on going into the future. And from my side, over to uh, Esther. Thanks, Esther. Thank you so much, Eric. That, that was very informative and helpful. Please um, continue to submit your questions uh, via the chat box. So we have one question uh, from one of the participants. Considering cost optimization in our organization, how can we best ensure that the low-income population that we serve feel the empathy as we are, uh, we are in a digital era where not all of them have access to Internet, which is one of the ways that the organizations have been doing cost optimization? Well, that is a great question because we often get the question um, uh, and the challenge that, Harrod, you and your team are telling us to do so many things, and that will mean a massive investment in the organization. So uh, uh, we don't have the money to become customer-centric. And my view is that nobody becomes customer-centric uh, and change overnight. It is a journey. It is a long-term journey. So the first important thing that you have to do is you have to understand where do you want to make the change in the organization? Where do you want to decrease costs? To, uh, to at the same time where you are decreasing cost by using, for example, mobile technology, do you want to keep and and uh, the the culture that you've created in the organisation when you were a human touch organisation? And the 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 challenge here is to design things in such a way that you echo your customers' needs in the way you design, the interaction with people, the individualization of people. So what I'm trying to argue is that it is important when you design a mobile uh, solution that you build in customer-centric notions in that mobile solution. And in that way, you keep that, that context, you keep the empathy. For example, a simple a uh, service where customers can send you SMSs when they don't understand specific aspects of your app or your mobile technology, rather than just leaving them to fend for themselves. Another way which Digicel did in Haiti is when they trained their customers uh, on using the functionality of mobile apps, they trained them one by one, and it didn't work because customers were um, uh, not empowered in one-by-one -one sessions because the agents were always in haste. They just have so little time for the customers. So what I did is I changed the training to community training, and I trained groups of customers, children, old people, older people, uh, the customers themselves. And what happened in the communities is they advised each other. Some people grasped the concept quicker than others, and they started helping each other. So it was like a community-based process. So for to the person asking that question, um, the reality is that you can actually do it low cost if you know what to build in your design of that solution and you do it over time and not do everything overnight. And the next question? Yes, so we have a um, question around data-driven strategy. So where do you see how the data-driven strategy as a customer-centric approach? Ah. That's actually a little bit of a trick question, I think, um, because I, um, 
I uh, often say that nowadays we live in a surveillance economy. And it's not that I give you my data, it's that you take my data and you do stuff with it. Now, I, um, I feel a data and a data-driven strategy is extremely important in a customer-centric approach. And let me give you an example just how we can use our own data on customer uh, transactions in an organization um, because all of those transactions are normally what I call date stamped, time stamped, uh, it is place stamped, it happened in a certain place, and suddenly you would know by just looking at your data where customers prefer to be served, when they prefer to do their transactions, uh, which are the crunch times, the end of the week, the end of the month, etc. So yes, it's extremely important, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we protect our customers' data, that we protect their privacy, that we protect their capital, which is their data, and that we use it for a good purpose. But data is an essential component of customer-centric approaches. Great. So the next question is um, around speed and servicing clients. So uh, right now in the mushrooming of MFI, speed and servicing client is the name of the game. How can you balance personal touch and digitization of services? And I will add to that, um, as you talk about sort of um, about the mind and heart as part of the change process, how, is it, how important is it to actually get close to your customers and hearing their stories and experiences in that process? It's extremely important, and we mustn't forget there's another question just before that one uh, around uh, the role of social performance managers that we also have yeah. to go to. Um, so uh, uh, um, I think that we quite often think about digital as, as just about speed and not digital also empowering you to do many other things with your customers. Now, if you think about a mobile phone, a mobile phone and especially a smartphone provides so many um, essential uh, uh, options for you when you design customer-centric solutions that you can actually do a transaction at speed, but at the same time interact with the customer if there's a problem or two by using text services. Um, you know where the customer is um, because you have a locational service. And that may be that if you see a customer running into a problem with a transaction, that you send them to your nearest office to where they are. There are so many things you can build in here that's not only about speed. Um, so, uh, so I'm trying to, uh, to make the point that a journey with digital is very important. In other words, you first try and get the customer onboarded, and there it shouldn't be speed. There it should be making sure that the customer gets all the right information, empowering the customer how to use it. And as you go along on this customer journey from onboarding to actually the transactions and the relationship with the customer, the speed can pick up. The, uh, the transactions will be quicker because the customers will now be empowered. They have been trained. They've built up skills to use the app. And therefore, you must always see this as a journey with customers and not as, okay, now I want a transaction in four seconds and that's it. Good. We finished. Next transaction. It is about building that empathy, that understanding of the customer, that continuous interaction with customers and testing how they experience your app or your service and then the speed comes over time, would be my answer. Great. So we'll move on to the social performance uh, related question. So what should be the role of social performance managers in the change process, and how do you integrate social performance indicators to this? So thank you. This is an interesting question. I would argue that um, the way I understand social performance management and even the SMART campaign, which is another campaign, uh, and an effort is that most of the guidelines of the, uh, the social performance task force are already customer-centric, and they overlap at least 70% with what we have in the guide to customer-centric change. So uh, my first answer is social performance managers are already sort of guided through their guidelines to be customer-centric. But the second part of my answer would be that um, you should do a conscious integration of this. I, I think in the change process, 
the role of champions in the organization that drive the change process is a big emphasis in the change management toolkit. And therefore, using social performance managers as champions in the organization will integrate them right into the change process and also in the change towards a customer-centric organization. So that may be a powerful instrument to use them as part of your champions in the organizations. Now, let me just uh, uh, um, cite a word of caution here. You should not only use your social performance manager for that. You should... Um, uh, use the social performance manager as part of a cross-functional team to effect change in the organization. And it's always important to showcase your champions in the organization for change, to reward them, to show that their behavior is approved by the management and leadership, because that is part of a cultural change in the organization. And management and leadership should also play the role of role models in the organization for this. I hope that helps to answer that question. So Howard, you touched a bit about um, cost to a firm. This question relates to actually cost to customers. Has CGAT developed the tools for assessing the cost to customers, such as when moving from using cash to using digital services? And will these tools be made available at some point if we do have such a tool? No. Um, uh, that specific question I see comes from Veselina. So, uh, Veselina from WSBI. Um, Veselina, you know, we've chatted about this so much. We actually have an area of work on customer value, and part of that is to understanding customer cost to be served. Now, it is so interesting, and I see we have a little bit of time. Um, let me elaborate on this. Uh, when I used to work for banks and with banks, when I asked them about what is the cost to the customer to be served, they never understood that question. They immediately looked at cost to do the company because that they know in their business case. And when we start challenging them and say, but no, 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 the customer has a cost to be served by you. Think about this. The customer has to pay for the service. They have to identify themselves, so they've got to get ID documents and show where they come from in terms of their, uh, where they live, their address. Um, they have to, uh, to um, also uh, experience a little bit of stress and fear when they owe you money and they go behind. So there's a psychological cost. And then there's a social cost as well, because you may offer uh, products in such a way that it's actually um, uh, sort of drive social cost in terms of age or gender or uh, religion. For example, if I'm from the Islamic faith and I want to improve my business, expand my business, and there's no Sharia-compliant um, financial services in my specific area, and I take a loan from a bank and I pay interest, then I'm acting against my religion and I may be ostracized by my community, and there's a cost to it. So. Uh, so yes, we've been working on this, Vesalina, and quite soon you'll see a publication or two around it. We have um, elements of assessing the cost to customer in several of the toolkits, uh, like the customer uh, experience toolkit, where we look at customer journey and why customers fall out of the journey. And that is an element of the cost that's incurred, but, uh, but we don't have a comprehensive toolkit on cost to customer. And maybe you've given us an idea here that we can work on that. But I can help you offline to find the places where you can get elements of such a toolkit. Great. The next uh, topic that's covered in the question is about segmentation. So how do you ensure that segmentation is done properly uh, to move towards sort of a customer-centric approach or strategy? Um, and then the second part to that question is how change occurs when shifting to another business strategy that actually affects the segmentation dramatically? Oh, that is, a, that is a very, very intricate question. I'm going to try and answer it at a high level. That's what we normally do when we don't have the granular answer. <laughs> and um, and um, you can also contact me offline uh, if you want more on this, uh, uh, on the segmentation. But firstly, um, the, the, the proof of good segmentation is when you actually check your segmentation back. In other words, I've segmented my portfolio and I've 
sub-segmented my portfolio and I've identified a specific segment with specific profiles and I've defined a persona that describes that segment. Now I go back to my to my uh, staff members, my field staff, and I say, do you recognize this segment? Is this segment the way it is uh, described in the segmentation? So you always have to check back whether your segments are valid. And, um, and you can also check back by doing small qualitative surveys with your customers. It's important before you plan a lot of things on a segment profile that you've um, analyzed and that you came up with, before you plan a lot of stuff, it is very important to check the segmentation. But there's a second way to check segmentation, and that is by the way we actually do um, a rapid uh, prototyping nowadays. So what I would do is I would um, design a solution for that specific sub-segment that you've uh, segmented, and I will go and test that solution in a, what we call a low fidelity way, a low cost way, with paper products, et cetera, you know, instead of building an app, just drawing little examples of the app and test it with the people in that segment to see whether you have really defined what they need and the solution that will speak to them and the experience that will speak to them in the right way. So always test back. That is, and rapid prototyping is a powerful way to do it, and we have it in the toolkits. The second part of your question is a very, very powerful question because if you change your business model, remember one part of the business model, if you look at the business model canvas uh, in the customer experience toolkit and in the resources, is um, the customers, the segmentation, and the value proposition per segment. You will have in that business model, uh, your new business model, you will have to redefine that and come up with the new value propositions. And then you will have to design a journey in your organization from the old to the new. And that is a very intricate uh, process. It's a very difficult process, but following a, a granular change process will help you in your quest to do that. I think we're the pretty last. much out of time at this point, or do we have uh, time Maybe for one more question? One more, yeah. Um, so the next question relates to um, the participant understanding that customer centricity is, is helpful for organizational development and retaining customers. Now, how do you actually identify the key thing that will uh, help the, you know, an organization be customer centric? So um, as I've alluded earlier, we have several diagnostics and exercises that you can do. Uh, and I think start with the diagnostic that is on the website. It has 36 questions and it tests you in terms of your customer-centric capability and awareness on five dimensions, on leadership and culture, on empowering employees, on how your operations are focused on the customer, how your, you have, whether you have the capability to design and deliver customer experience, and it helps you to assess the value of what you do for the customer and for the firm. So start with that. Um, if you want to look at strategic direction, use the little exercise we've given you today, but use it uh, as a collective in your organization with the leadership. And as you go through the toolkits, you'll find other um, methods and, inter and assessments that you can do. For example, in the customer change toolkit. There is the customer change canvas that we use that take you through a four-step process, how to run this change process. So there are several of these tools. And if you really don't know, just go to the website, press the contact us button and write to us. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to the last question, but thank you for joining us today. And we really encourage you to join the next webinar. Uh, on April 4th, focused on agent and employee empowerment. Um, and we will uh, definitely have the recording and some of the materials that was shared in the presentation available. And I will now hand this over to Valdete, my colleague, to discuss um, the sort of logistics and to close the, close the discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you, Herard and Esther, both. This was a great webinar. I really enjoyed it. And I, I'm, I could see from uh, participant engagement that 
participants enjoyed it as well. And I just want to ask everyone to take a quick poll just to let us know um, what you thought about the webinar. Was it relevant? Did you like the, the topic? And if you have any additional feedback that you would like to send us, uh, because it will help us inform um, our, our webinar strategy for the future. Um, we also, I, I really don't have many points to make, but I just want to say uh, that we will email you the webinar recording and any related material, and uh, you'll have the, the link to the website that uh, has all of the resources that Herard mentioned throughout the webinar. And um, you know, you're welcome to get back in touch with us um, for any questions that you might have. And I just hope that you come back to our next webinar. Um, we'll post the link for registration to our next webinar in the chat box. If you'd like to register right away, um, that, that would be great. If not, you can always go back to our website on findevgateway.org and register from there. Um, thank you again, and have a good evening, good day, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you.